This video is going to be all about breaking glucose down to its building block and using that building block to form ATP. Now that whole cycle is three parts actually. The first part is going to be glycolysis, which is breaking it down to its building block. The second part is going to be your TCA cycle. And then the last part is going to be your electron transport chain or your ETC. And this is where you make ATP. Now the electron transport chain moves electron. That's where it gets its name from. And when we went over terminology in our first video, we talked about something that helps move electrons. Do you remember what that was? Those are your dehydrogenases. So ETC needs a lot of dehydrogenases. That's where TCA comes in. TCA is the bridge between glycolysis and ETC. It takes those building blocks and makes those dehydrogenases for the ETC cycle. So that is a three step process from glucose to ATP. We're gonna start first with glycolysis. It takes about a dozen steps to go from glucose to the building block in glycolysis. And it's important to look at the big picture first, not to get caught up in the nitty gritty facts. So we're gonna go through all the steps and all the enzymes and then pinpoint what facts they want you to know for the step. So let's start with glucose. And it immediately gets phosphorylated in the sixth position to become glucose six phosphate. And this is via the enzymes hexokinase and glucokinase. Glucose 6-phosphate becomes fructose 6-phosphate. And from that, with the help of his friend phospho fructose kinase 1, it becomes fructose 1,6-bis phosphate. That later becomes glyceraldehyde 3P. And with his friend glyceraldehyde 3P, dehydrogenase it becomes 1 3 bis phosphoglyceric acid <laughs> again very important to know what the abbreviated words stand for I'm just gonna say it and then write it abbreviated but again know both from 1 3 BPG becomes 3 PG we're almost there I'm gonna move this up this will be a continuation from 3PG to 2PG. And then finally, not finally, but near finally, 2PG to phosphoenolpyruvate acid, PEP, which we talked about in our first video. That has a helper, pyruvate kinase which makes pyruvate. And then lastly, pyruvate dehydrogenase makes acetyl-CoA. So what are the building blocks we're talking about? It'd be these two. These two can make a ton of things. And we're gonna focus on these moving forward okay this is the big picture this is just the overall schematic this is just the overall reactions and the products now we're going to look at the nitty gritty facts so let's start with the first step glucose to glucose 6 phosphate we add that phosphate group on there to trap glucose otherwise it would just leave the cell phosphate is negatively charged putting it on the glucose makes it hard for it to leave okay does that by hexokinase or Glucokinase, the reason we have two enzymes is because they work in tandem with each other. Hexokinase is found in a lot of places and it's great for when you have low glucose. Glucokinase is found in your liver and your pancreas and it's great for when you have a lot of glucose. So 
depending on your level, they work in tandem. Now the step isn't that nice, it won't put it in those terms. What I will say is that hexokinase has low KM and a low Vmax. What the heck does that mean? KM is just a term for affinity and it's inverse. So low KM means it has a high affinity. High KM means it has a low affinity. Vmax means capacity. Vmax is not inverse. Low Vmax means it has a low capacity. So it works great when there's not a lot of sugar around. High Vmax is high capacity. It would work great if there was high sugar around. So glucokinase is the exact opposite. It's high Km, high Vmax. So you can tell me now what that means. High Km means low affinity because it's inverse, remember? Then high Km or high Vmax means high capacity. That's why I say they work in tandem with each other. Now, there is a situation where you can have really, really high glucose in your blood, so much so that glucokinase can't handle it. And when it can't handle it, it recruits a friend called aldose reductase. Aldose reductase turns glucose into its alcohol alternative turns glucose into sorbitol. You remember from OCHEM, anything that ends in all is an alcohol? Well, sorbitol is glucose's alcohol alternative. And it turns in there and says, you know, just wait your turn. We're having a lot of sugar right now. We gotta take care of that sugar first, and then we'll put you into the cycle. So it waits and it waits and it waits as sorbitol. And then once all that sugar clears up, it can finally re-enter the cycle via sorbitol dehydrogenase. Good. Now, if all that sounds familiar to you, it's because you might have seen it in diabetic patients. Now, the next important step is F6P or fructose 6-phosphate to F16BP or fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. Does this by the enzyme PFK1. Important because this is the rate limiting step of all of glycolysis. And similar to the first step, works great at normal sugar levels, but if there's too much sugar, then it uses an enzyme called PFK2 to make fructose 2,6-bisphosphonate. And again, it's kind of like the holding area. It's saying, we're having a little bit too much sugar right now. Let me just put you in the holding area. Once we clear up, everything, then we can reinsert you back in the cycle. And that's what it does. Important to note, once you start making this, it really will rev up PFK1. It's telling it, you know, we're all waiting here. We really want to get back into the cycle. Okay, so that is another fact. Let's move on to the next step. F16BP gets worked on by aldolase. To make G3P. Now fructose is a six carbon sugar. G3P is a three carbon sugar. What happened to that other three carbon? Well, it becomes DHAP or dihydroacetone phosphate. That's where the other three carbons are and these look very similar and an enzyme called isomerase can switch them back and forth if need be. Allylase is seen in the liver as allylase B, seen in the muscles as allylase A. Let's move on to the next step. G3P to 1,3-BPG via G3P dehydrogenase. Then 1,3-BPG can become 2,3-BPG 
via red blood cell mutase. You remember 2,3 BPG? You might have remember, recall from your respiratory block. 2,3 BPG, right shifts that respiratory curve, releases more oxygen. Oxygen for us to use to create ATP. We're not gonna get too far into that. That's more for our respiratory block. Just keep that locked in your mind. 3PG and 2PG, not much important enzymes going on there. And then finally, we're getting to the home stretch and you know we're gonna talk a lot about these because again these are our core building blocks 2 pg to pep and then pep to pyruvate via pyruvate kinase now you can have a deficiency in pyruvate kinase and when you have a deficiency in pyruvate kinase you don't make that atp because you can't go down the cycle and cells that really really need this are like your red blood cells and when you don't have ATP for red blood cells they lysis. you so you have chronic hemolysis so pyruvate kinase deficiency causes hemolysis not only do you need to know that but you need to know what revs up pyruvate kinase. Well, I can think of a few things. If you have low ATP, for example, if you break ATP down and you need to break it down to power something, you'll get your ADPs and your AMPs. Those all rev it up because it's telling your body, hey, we need more ATP. If you have a lot of F16B, Again, it's telling us, you know, we have way too much substrate. We need to make some ATP. We're waiting here. Come on, we're waiting. That also revs it up. And then finally, something that revs it down is alanine. I'll tell you why in future videos, but alanine comes from pyruvate. So if you have too much alanine, it's basically a negative feedback loop. It's saying we have too much alanine. We have too much pyruvate. We don't need any more of this cycle. So that rubs it down. That's pyruvate kinase. Lastly, pyruvate dehydrogenase. Things that rev it up are gonna be your ADPs, your AMPs, basically the byproducts of breaking down ATP, telling your body, hey, we need more, just to replenish it. Calcium, for muscle contractions, when you're contracting muscles, you need more ATP. So you need the cycle to go on. And then another thing that revs it up is NAD plus. I want to talk about this just for a second. You know our next step is all about making dehydrogenases. We talked about that, right? Well, NADH is a dehydrogenase. And once it gets used up, it becomes NAD plus so we have a lot of nad plus we're basically saying we're used we're using up a lot of these dehydrogenases we need more we need to push this cycle further and that's why nad plus revs the cycle up now pyruvate dehydrogenase is not just a single enzyme it's actually a complex a massive complex made up of five subunits four of which are B vitamins so I'm just gonna draw it like this it doesn't look like this in real life but for simplicity sake five subunits the first subunit is B1 that is thiamine thiamine pyrophosphate second subunit is B2 which is riboflavin. FAD. Third is B3, niacin. Fourth is B5, pento 
Phenic CoA. And the last one is not a B vitamin, it is the poic acid. Some clinical relevance, arsenic is a poison, it'll kill you. Arsenic actually blocks the poic acid. By blocking that, you block the cycle, lose ATP, you die. I think that does it, and a lot of people say, do I actually need to memorize this? Yes, you do, because we're gonna be seeing this complex in the next video. So you do need to memorize this. Common question they ask is just, you know, what enzyme needs thiamine? What they're trying to get at is this complex. And so pyruvate dehydrogenase needs thiamine because thiamine makes up the enzyme. That does it for this video. Next video, we're gonna talk about the TCA cycle.